So after opening up Mac Vector, you're going to need to open up your genome file. Okay, as you can see, there's several tabs here. Um, the editor tab basically just shows you your genome. You can change the view mode by just dragging this blocking. If you want to see one continuous strand or you want to see it in blocks, um, you do that by dragging the slider. The topology is whether it's circular or linear DNA. So if you click on that, it'll it's now circular if you look at the map. Or if you click it again, it changes it to sing, single strand DNA or double strand DNA. The replica button just creates just like it sounds, a replica of your DNA, so you can work with this and work with that. Oftentimes, this unlock button will be ch will be closed when you first open up the genome, and you can't do anything with your genome if it's locked. So, normally, you're going to want to unlock your file. The DNA button changes it from DNA to RNA, as you can see. The thymines become your your cells, so you know it's become RNA. Now, if you want to say add, annotate your genome, if you want to add a gene, you hit, you can select the create feature, and feature can be anything from, well, gene to a signal to anything in this list basically. So let's go ahead and create a gene. So we're gonna say the start location is at one and the stop location is 500, and you can change between continuous, all that good stuff. And basically this right here is if you want to have it at that location or before the location. Just pretty self-explanatory. So that adds the location of the gene. Now down here, this adds the description of the gene. So let's say, well, it's a gene. And we know that, let's say it's a, that it codes for a membrane protein. So now as we look at our map, we notice that there is the gene we just added right there and a description of it if we double click on it. If we go to features, it lists it right there and the annotations is just a description of your entire file. So one of the nice features of this program, you can run blast searches directly from within the program. So you can change whether you want to run blast and blast x, t blast x, Let's go ahead and run a BlastX here. The database is obviously going to change depending on what program we're running, whether it be a Blast or BlastX. So NR, I believe, is NCBI, Swiss Protein Database. The expect, that's the E value. Um, matrix, that's the algorithm we're going to be using, so Blossom60. Let's just leave it as defaults. And you can sort it by the P value. I believe the high score is the E value, and total score is everything taken, isn't taken into consideration. So let's go ahead and look for possible gene between 10.509 and 12.758. And obviously it takes a minute to run. It has to send the information to the server and then receive it back. So if you right click on this little icon down here, you can show job manager and this will show everything that's in the queue. And once it's finished, you can hit the view button to view your report. <coughs> Also, the preferences button right here, if you're experiencing crashes, let's say because you have an i5 processor in your new Mac, you can suppress the use of multiple CPUs for that specific job and it'll prevent it from crashing. So let's go ahead and view the report that popped up. So let's see, we had four possible hits. So now we just have a description list and a last line sequences list of your possible proteins. This gives the exact same information as if you were doing it online through NCBI, the blast search through there, but it's nice because you can do it directly in your program. Also another nice feature here, you can search online databases for information, so you can hit a lot of different databases up for information. So let's go ahead and just leave it for all fields. You can filter it. Let's look for E. coli, and let's go ahead and say and phage. So
So now it's just going to search for Fage and E. coli, some type of gene within the gene database with Fage and E. coli in its name. Let's go ahead and click on it. And I'll pull down the information, and now you have the gene directly here. And here's some more information about it. And here's some information specifically about the gene we're looking at. So if you knew the specific gene you were looking at, or a family of genes you were looking at, you can search the gene database by typing in the information you know about it, which is really nice. Okay, a couple other things here. Um, the base composition button up here, you can search for different things, frequencies of um, specific nucleotide frequencies. Um, also, temperature information. So let's say you want to do some annealing. So it's a DNA-DNA complex probably here. So let's go ahead and do it for the whole, whole strand. And now, as you can see, it calculates your melting point for DNA. DNA DNA duplex, which is really nice if you're doing any annealing experiments. Um, one thing though, it's not 100% accurate, but it's close enough that you can start your experiment with that estimated value. It's pretty close to the real thing, but not exactly. You can also look for open reading friend by clicking the little ORFS button up here. Gonna have to check that. And you can use Flickett's method and, or you don't have to. So now let's go ahead and look for open reading frame for the whole DNA. And you can search the plus strand or just the minus strand. We're going to search for both because we don't know how it's read exactly. So let's go ahead and lift ORFs by length. We can get a nice visual ORF map and an annotated sequence. So this is just your sequence of DNA with the annotations added directly on here with the possible ORF. So there's the first ORF, there's your second ORF, and here's a list of all our DNA, or all our ORFs listed by length. And this is just a visual map. You're not going to get much information from this normally if you have a lot of possible ORFs. One important thing is when you're searching for ORFs, you can specify the minimum number of amino acids for each reading frame. So, um, obviously, the larger this number is, the less hits your, or the, the less ORFs you're going to get. And the smaller the number is, the more ORFs you're going to get. Something else really nice with the program is you can do a restriction enzyme search for cut sites. So, um, the file right here is the database of possible restrictions enzymes you can use. It comes with a few built in, but you're going to have to download a list from the internet. So let's go ahead and use a list it came with. So common enzyme. Let's search everything within that list, or you can even specify select specific enzymes within that list or filter by other criteria. We're just going to search them all with a number of cut sites of, let's say, at least five, but or at least three and at most five and now you can specify the region you're going to apply that research and enzyme analysis so let's go ahead and use the whole thing the whole genome Hit OK now you can list cutters by name, number of cuts you can also list non-cutters which I mean isn't going to be a we're not going to really want in this case you can filter it by number of cuts here by site size by how it ends, whether it's a blunt cut or five prime cut. Now let's go ahead and show. And as you can see now we have a cut map of where it's going to cut at. You can you can obviously zoom in on this a little bit. It doesn't really help too much. Here's a text file showing where the cuts are. As you can see, the cut begins at 50. And there's another cut. This restriction enzyme cuts it right here and ends right there. Here's a predictions of where it cuts from and to, what enzyme, what type of over, or whether there is an overhang or not. And here's also a list of the cutters that match our criteria. So let's say we want to translate um, 
a sequence of DNA to a protein. So let's say we found an R at 10.509 and 12.758. A. Now let's just go ahead and use the whole segment of DNA. This is where it begins and this is where the DNA ends. Once again, what type? And you can save it as a new protein, but in this case we just want to see what it outputs. So now here's a translation of our protein from base pairs to amino acids. So, it's, so there's an abbreviation for the proteins. And as you can see, this is where we specify the start and stopping point of the OR that we specified. And also here is just, it tells a summary page of what the different codons equal, or what amino acids, and at what number we found them at. Or sorry, I mean the number of the amino acid that we found and the percentage that it makes up of that entire segment. Okay, the auto annotate button up here is basically for if we download some from GeneBank, it'll display the text file without the map. So in this case, we really didn't download anything, but if we were to download some from GeneBank or PubMed or PubMed, you can auto annotate and it'll fill in all those annotations that they had online for you. And one other thing that you notice, I got a little error message there. When the DNA or when your genome is locked, you can't edit the file at all. You have to unlock it. So one another reminder, you have to have it unlocked if you want to do anything to the DNA or your genome that you're working with.